Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we cover here are not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. When the F-102A Delta Dagger, that used for everybody, entered service in 1956, it was a revolutionary plane, but nothing could hide the fact that it was just barely compliant with the Air Force specifications. In fact, at the end of 1951, difficulties with the fire control system and the engines de facto split the program in two. The F-102A had to be an interim solution why the F-102B, being the fully compliant plane, expected to enter service at a later time. Now, difficulties with the F-102A forced Convert to divert resources from the F-102B, which actually fell even more behind. So, in one of the most spectacular applications of the principle that nothing is more permanent than a temporary solution, about a thousand F-102A were produced. However, despite the numbers, the F-102 shortfalls as an interceptor were rather clear. The plane speed was limited to Mach 1.25, uh, mostly because of the interim engine, the Pratt & Whitney J57, uh, which did not have the adequate thrust. And also, the plane fire control system was not providing all the functions that were required being a simplified version of the original specification. So, something better had to be developed. For the F-102B, the so-called cook Craigie approach was taken. No prototype was built, but a limited number of production units had to be delivered so changes could be incorporated directly on the production line. This could shorten the time to delivery if there was just a limited number of changes to make, but it risked having a relatively large number of underperforming planes already built that might have required a complex and expensive retrofit once a stable configuration was reached. If now you are thinking to a more modern plane, I won't stop you. However, by 1956, the development of the F-102B was moving forward at a steady pace, and the plane that was taking shape had a clear lineage with the F-102A, but also so many differences that in June 1956, it was renamed F-106A, the Delta Dart. The first F-106A rolled out of the production line in December 1956. It flew for the first time in the Boxing Day of 1956, a clear indication of how rushed was the entire program. And as soon as the plane took the air, problems started. So during the first flight, the turbine of the new J-75 engine performed irregularly, the air brakes opened but not closed, and still the MA-1 fire control system was missing and there was some ballast in its place. But these were not the main problems, there was more. The early tests measured the speed of Mach 1.9 at 57,000 feet, much better than the F-102, but still below the expectations. What surprised everyone, including Convair, was that the supersonic acceleration was abysmal. It took four and one half minutes to accelerate from Mach 1 to Mach 1.7, and another two and one half minutes to accelerate from Mach 1.7 to Mach 1.8. So after all, the number one reason for adopting a delta wing was to have a good transonic and supersonic behavior. And then this happens? This was totally unexpected. Converse engineers were seeing the ghost of what happened a few years before with the F-102 coming back to haunt them. No used to say the United States Air Force was not happy at all, and once again the whole program was at risk. Luckily, the problem this time was not so bad and did not require the genius of Whitcomb to fix it. 
even if Whitcomb was still working for Convert at the time and the F106 bears his signature in various areas. This time, change indeed. Air intakes was enough. The lips of the intake were thinned down and their capture area was increased, increasing the airflow going through it. Uh, the increase in size is relatively easy to understand the J75P9 engine could handle more flow than it was fed, so it didn't produce all the thrust it was capable. Eventually, the P9 engine was replaced by the P17 version, which was rated uh, for 76.5 kN dry and 109 kN wet. The reason why thin intake lips helped is a bit more difficult to understand. So, Air intakes and propulsion in general are very complex subjects, but as usual, let's try to explain in an intuitive manner. So the main function of the air intakes is to recover pressure. The air moving toward the plane has a lot of kinetic energy and it is desirable to have this energy converted into pressure at the entrance of the engine. The more pressure there is, the more will be available to be added to the engine work the more will be available to expand uh, the gas through the nozzle to generate thrust. At supersonic speed, the air decelerates through the formation of shock waves. Uh, that is a thin layer where speed is abruptly diminished and pressure increases. When uh, actually a shock reaches your ear, you hear what is normally called a sonic boom. In front of a blunt shape, uh, the shock is very strong, the air deceleration is very high, and it stays at a distance from the shape. The stronger the shock is, the more energy is wasted, and the lower is the pressure behind it. Strong shock waves dissipate a lot of energy and create a lot of drag. Weaker shock waves are more efficient and create less drag. And the way to have a weaker shock is to use a pointy shape. The shock will be practically attached to the shape and it will be weaker. There will be a better pressure recovery and a lower drag. An even better improvement is to have the flow slow down through multiple weaker shocks and the mobile ramps visible on the intake do just that with the plus of adjusting their position to avoid shock interference among each other and with the plane boundary layer in different flight conditions. At the end of the day, the difference was not small at all. In the case of the F-106, the improvement in pressure recovery was estimated between 15 and 18%, and the acceleration time from Mach 1 to Mach 2 went down to three minutes. So while everybody was having a sigh of relief because the program was saved, like it always happens with high-tech projects, problems were not over. The fire control, now dubbed MA1, was chronically late and it became available only in 1957 in the first production version, but it will keep receiving updates during all its operational life. The cockpit configuration was changed a few times before stabilizing with different types of instruments and different position of a control stick. The radar control, the fire controls and the horizontal situation indicator, uh, which actually was a navigation aid and not a video game screen. Other defects had to be ironed out during the pre-production and the first years of operational service, like fuel flow deficiencies, electric generations, uh, issues and a canopy accidentally jettisoned in flight. Even the ejector seat was changed and modified a few times before becoming safe and reliable, not without killing some pilots. Also the wing, at the beginning identical to the F-102, was involved in several iterations, where boundary layer fences were added and removed, slats were adopted, camber change and wing tip twist updated to the point of attaining relevant differences between a unit and another about the way the plane handled. The interesting thing was that rather than fixing everything on the prototypes, thanks to the Coop Craigie approach, every batch of planes had a different set of updates and it was different from the others. The Air Force in 1960 will have to launch a program to bring all the planes to the same standard 
at least for the fire control unit and, and the logistical nightmare of having so many different versions. Because of all these hiccups, the Air Force grew increasingly cold toward the plane. Even because the F-101 had been introduced as a temporary measure, and at the end of the day it was doing pretty well. Once again, the program was being outright cancelled. This did not happen, but the number of planes on order was greatly reduced, with the motivation of this actually being just the high tier of the air defense system. And we will see, it will be a justified position. Only 260 planes were ordered and later 35 planes used for tests were converted to the stable standard and handed over to the fighter squadrons. Including the double-seaters for training, about 340 F-106 were built equipping 14 squadrons. The aircraft was slowly replaced by the F-15 from the beginning of the 70s, but it served for a very long time after that, the last being retired in 1988. Stop there, we are not even nearly finished yet. The best is yet to come. The plane served briefly in Korea and Germany, but the bulk of the deployment was always in the continental United States, under the Air Defense Command, and there was a very good reason for that. The F-106 had a very close integration with the SAGE system. The SAGE was a chain of radars and common posts, all connected and integrated together, covering the northern approaches to the North American continent. The purpose of the system was to meet a Soviet bomber offensive with a coordinated effort, employing all the available assets in an optimized way. The story of the SAGE is not only one of military technology, but also one of the first attempts to use computers to coordinate and automate a battle space. Uh, it is actually a story that will serve a long video in the future. The assets available to SAGE were guided missiles, like the Bomark, piloted interceptors, like the F-102 Deuce or the F-101 Voodoo, and anything in between like the F-106 Delta Dart. In fact, after taking off, the SAGE system could take control of the plane by feeding the bearing and the altitude to the autopilot uh, using one of the first military data links uh, with a range of many hundred miles. The plane could literally be flown remotely toward the target. Since the long-range and low-frequency radars integrated into the SAGE system could not pinpoint the location of a target, uh, it is actually a physical limitation connected with the frequency and the way electromagnetic waves do propagate, the plane had to identify the exact target position with its own sensors. While on the F-102 this function was left to the pilot, on the F-106 it was a task of the AM-1 fire control system, the plane could be handed the approximate position of a target by the SAGE, located to the precision uh, with its own sensor, and attack it automatically, firing the weapons and placing the plane on an escape route, all without the pilot participation. The only task left to the pilot was to check the proper functioning of the systems, ready to pick up in case of malfunction. In the context of the SAGE, the pilot was really needed only for takeoff, landing, and as a backup system, uh, and for this reason, a tactical situation display between the pilot's feet showed a moving map of the route across the ground during the intercept. As on the F-102A, the armament was housed internally in a large weapons bay that was closed by pneumatically operated double folding doors. The original armament was all missile. There was a single Douglas Air II Genie unguided missile equipped with a 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead. This was complemented by four use I 
IM4E uh, Falcon radar homing or IM4G infrared homing air to air missiles. The F-102A had unguided 2.75 inches missiles mounted on the weapons bay doors, but these were not retained on the F-106. The Gemini missile was carried in the rear half of the missile bay. It was powered by a 163 kN TOCOL TU-389 rocket motor and it was unguided. It relied on the nuclear warhead to ensure a kill and since there was no guidance system but just a safety mechanism to prevent premature detonations, it could not be jammed. Launch weight was about 360 kg and maximum velocity was Mach 3.3. Snap-out rear fins gave the missile stability during flight. The range was about 8 miles and flight time to target was about 12 seconds and the effective blast radius was estimated to be about 300 meters against a heavy bomber. The Falcons were a conventional warhead adaptation of the nuclear-tipped uh, AIM-26A Falcon. The two semi-active radar homing AIM-4E Falcons were carried in the forward half of the weapons bay whereas the AIM-4G infrared homing missiles were carried in the rear half of the weapons bay, stores on the side of the Jenny. All Falcon missiles were contact fused, with the fuses located on the leading edges of all four fins, so that a direct hit on the target was needed to score a kill. The Falcon missiles could be launched in a single salvo or, more commonly, in pairs. Because the aerodynamic range of the AIM-4F was greater than the range of its seeker, the IR-guided AIM-4G was the preferred means of attacking a fast-moving target. At high closure speed in a head-to-head -head situation, for example, the AIM-A1 fire control system would present two separate firing solutions, one for the AIM-4G and the other for the AIM-4F. If all four missiles were to be fired, the four Gs were fired first, so they would not inadvertently lock onto the radar-guided missiles rather than the target, which was also the reason why the 4F pair was carried in the rear bay. It was not possible to fire the missiles one by one, because the pneumatic system that had only enough high pressure stored for three cycles of the armament system. So the original F-106 had only had three shots available. One Genie, one pair of IM-4F, and one pair of IM-4G. The last F-106 was delivered in July 1961, but as we have already pointed out, the plane kept receiving improvements and updates throughout most of its career something that was needed for the F-106 more than for other planes, because the cook Reggie approach. The fire control system, in particular, kept improving its reliability and performance throughout the most of the plane career. By 1963, all the planes had been equipped with a retractable infrared search and track in front of the cockpit. One may wonder, what was the use of an infrared search and track for a highly automated machine like the F-106? In 1961, the Air Defense Command had budgeted about 80 new aircraft to cope with the attrition rate and fill the gaps. The original idea was to reopen the assembly line for the F-106. However, however, the Air Defense Command had heard so much about the F-4 Phantom II, the new US Navy two-seat interceptor, and so they pushed the, the Air Force to hold a competition between the F-4 and the F-106, performing the same missions. The competition result was that the F-4 system had better performances and were more reliable. Its radar could lock on targets at a much longer range than the F-106. However, something utterly unexpected happened. In air-to-air -air combat against the F-106, the Delta Dart almost systematically defeated the Phantom. The idea that the F-106 could be a versatile interceptor rather than a guided missile with a backup human pilot started to emerge. For the record, after the competition, the, the Air Force will go on acquiring the F-4 for the Tactical Air Command and the Air Defense Command will receive no planes. So, having surprised everyone with its dogfighting abilities, there were serious thoughts about sending the F-106 to Vietnam which in the end did not happen. 
However, the idea of equipping the plane with what was necessary and useful for air to air combat went ahead. The new emerging scenario was that of a bomber flying at low altitude below the radar coverage, maybe with some escort fighters. In this case, the SAGE could not automatically guide the interceptor, and the whole idea of exploding a nuclear device close to ground deep in friendly territory, well, wasn't brilliant at all. The infrared search and track was used particularly at night to search for the bomber's infrared signature against the cold ground. Also, since the Genie missile was no longer useful in this scenario, it was replaced with something much more classic, a 20mm M61A1 Gatling cannon housed inside the weapons bay in place of the Genie. Only 75 F106 were equipped with the gun, those that were could be distinguished by a ventral bulge housing uh, the barrels. Technical constraints limited the fire rate to 4,500 rounds per minute, uh, anyway enough to empty the 650 rounds magazine in less than 9 seconds. The F-106 served for a long time, the last flying units being decommissioned in 1988. At the time, the F-106A had the distinction of recording the lowest single-engine aircraft accident record in the Air Force history. Other than its main mission, it was used by NASA uh, for research programs and after decommissionings as a target drone for weapons testing. As we said, a limited number is still in store at Davis Mountain, waiting for a call that will never come, or will it? If you like this video, you will be interested in the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please stay safe. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.